Welcome back to the Ignite podcast. Today, we're delighted to have Ryan Mapes. He's the CEO and co-founder uh, co of Release. And uh, Ryan, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'd love to get an intro from you for the audience. Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, Ryan Mapes, as, as Brian said, uh, co-founder and CEO of Release. We are a finance and banking platform for multifamily owners. So think uh, folks that own small apartment complexes, anywhere from really maybe five units up to 100 units in size. We provide working capital to them and, uh, and bespoke banking services, uh, specifically built for multifamily owners. It's a very interesting concept when I first heard it. You know, it's kind of this verticalized fintech uh, yeah. startup. How did you come across this idea? Like, what's your early career and how did you stumble onto this idea? Yeah, sort of a, a personal challenge um, that I was running into myself. And so, you know, I spent a number of years in, in San Francisco running growth at a handful of venture backed startups. We had a couple of decent exits along the way. Most recently, we sold an aviation marketplace to an airline out there uh, before the pandemic hit. So probably world's luckiest timing from an exit standpoint uh, and all of that, but you know, you'll take it in the venture life. And so uh, as luck would have it though, while I was out there, I was actually investing in multifamily properties myself. And so love the real estate space. Um, I think it's super interesting that, you know, a ton of angles that, that we can talk about there. Uh, but I was investing myself and, and, you know, really post this last exit, finally wanted to double down, grow my own portfolio on the real estate side. And, and so I did exactly what you expect that, you know, I reached out to a handful of my friends who were already investing in multifamily at a, you know, a much uh, larger stage, right? You know, some had hundreds of units, others even had thousands. And I just asked them, you know, like, what are the limiting factors uh, when you, you know, when you go to, to grow your portfolio, what will I run into, right? Like, what can I, you know, sort of mitigate in advance? And, um, you know, a handful of challenges, most people would say, you know, hey, you got to find deal flow, make sure your underwriting's tight, some of the basic sort of blocking and tackling. But time and time again, working capital kept coming up as a major pain point for them. And so, look, as you scale your, your portfolio, you need working capital for renovations on your existing properties, or you need it for a down payment uh, to go buy your next investment property, right? Sure, you can go get long-term debt on the rest of it, but you have to keep coming up with this initial capital uh, to buy a property or additional capital to, to go ahead and, and renovate them, right? And ultimately yeah. you know, push up rents and, and all of that stuff. And so, you know, we dove in uh, from that angle and, and said, hey, like, how could you solve this in a new way, right? It's very challenging to find, uh, you know, they might turn to hard money or they might turn to private investors, uh, but both are, you know, have a lot of challenges with, with the solutions. And so we said, look, like we could approach this from a revenue-based financing angle. And, and we looked around and it just didn't mm. exist, right? It, you know, it existed in other asset classes, certainly within the startup space, you would see it in, you know, SaaS financing and, and some of these yeah, other Even plays. venture capital has a, you know, capital call line that you can sure. get. Yeah, you know, exactly. I'm going to be calling capital. I have commitments, but I have some short-term working capital needs and bank will float you that, that money on a line. You got it. Yeah, you got it. But on, on the multifamily side, it didn't exist, particularly the revenue-based financing angle. And so... So, you know, we went after it, we spun it up and uh, that demand has really skyrocketed there. I mean, you, you have the idea and you think, yeah, you know, I think this is a good idea, but you don't really know, right? Uh, mm. But it has, right? I mean, it's, uh, it, it's been loved by borrowers and, and uh, frankly, we're trying to keep up, right? But uh, all yeah. good stuff. It's really surprising that there wasn't any revenue-based financing because multifamily is such a big asset class. I mean, how many trillions of dollars are, are tied up in multifamily in the U.S. alone? It, it is. Yeah, it is. But you yeah. know what's unique about it is that, uh, you know, in, in multifamily or in real estate in general, there's typically already a first position lien on a property, right? Just think like, you know, just a standard long-term debt, some mortgage yeah. uh, on a property. And so it's not obvious how you would be able to pledge any free cash flow off of uh, those existing assets and use something like revenue-based financing. And so, you know, we spent quite a bit of time and, you know, candidly, uh, so, you know, a lot of our own cash working with fintech <laughs> lawyers, contract lawyers, real estate lawyers, all of these folks yeah. to really understand all of the details in here to, to make sure that, yes, indeed, you can do this and here's how it needs to be structured and, and it works, right? And so yeah. um, I think most people don't go to those lengths to really dive in. They most mostly would say, ah, there's already a mortgage on it. It, it can't be done. But it can actually. Yeah. Now this is really interesting. Um, I was just looking at another uh, company actually that uh, does a, basically a simple agreement for future equity in your home, um, which sure. is another kind of uh, you know equity based financing sure. for single families. Very interesting company. I'll 
tell you about it maybe another time or they'll, yeah. they'll be probably on the podcast at some point. But um, what are kind of the typical terms that uh, these multifamily property owners are, are getting on these uh, revenue-based financing kind of mm-hmm. deals? Yeah, sure. So it's short-term working capital, right? Um, and so, you know, certainly it's, um, you know, can be a bit more expensive than a long-term note, right? If you're out there trying yeah. to get, you know, 25 or 30-year terms, it, you know, it's totally different. Uh, it's a totally different product. Um, for us, though, these durations tend to be anywhere between 12 and 24 months. It can be shorter. We generally won't go beyond that. You start to take on a different risk profile and um, it changes your underwriting, your speed, mm-hmm. all of these details. So really, we compete against hard money lenders. We compete against private investors. If you have a network of high net worth individuals, you might go out and do that. That has its own you know, challenges and pros and cons to it. Um, but we are, there's no interest rate in revenue-based financing. What we're doing is essentially buying your future cash flows at an upfront discount. So there's a discount mm. rate involved there, right? And um, that, of course, floats with uh, interest rates that are out there, our own cost of capital and all of that. So at the moment, you're, you're probably looking at the low teens for sure yeah. um, in, in that cost of capital. That's an, and that's pretty reasonable, I think. And then are you typically underwriting this in a, in, a, in a typical kind of loan fashion? So you're looking at, you know, debt coverage ratio, service ratios, historical cash flows. I mean, you're basically underwriting a 12 month loan, right? We do. Yep. That's exactly right. So, you know, you think about, you know, some of the, just the basic parameters we care deeply about, obviously the owner, the operator themselves, right? I mean, of course you're going to do all sorts of uh, checks there to make sure they they are indeed who they say they are, right? They're not some fraudster. I mean, of course you do KYC, KYB, all those types of checks behind the scenes. We care deeply about their portfolio. So it's important to call out that we're funding against your existing portfolio of properties. This is not, um, we're not funding against the new property that you're looking to buy. That's quite different. We're funding yeah. against the cash flows on your existing portfolio. So we care deeply about how they're performing. Uh, and, and so we care about the cash flows there. We're looking at obviously trailing income statements, rent rolls, those types of details. And we're simply trying to predict how well will this perform over the next 12 months, for example, right? Yeah. And if it's cash flowing, it's stabilized, has been for years, you can get pretty comfortable uh, with you know how it's going to cash flow over the next 12 months. I mean, they all have leases on them as well, right? It's, it's right. unlikely that in you know a 50 or 100 unit portfolio that everybody just walks away day one, right? It's, it's right. pretty unlikely. So how do you protect yourself in those catastrophic kind of downside scenarios where yeah. maybe there is a massive fire or something like that to the building? Sure. Yeah, sure. So look, so if, if literally, if there's a fire or something like that, we're protected there, right? Insurance payouts and all that, of course, yeah, you know, yeah. we would, we would be uh, on the receiving end as well to get paid out there. So um, that's all well and good. Uh, look, you know, like for us, really, the disaster scenario is that all of a sudden, the, the portfolio just stops performing, right? Um, realistically, it won't stop performing day one or else we've just done a terrible job with underwriting. We completely <laughs> missed, you know, like how the portfolio is functioning or, or whatever it may be. Um, you know, I think a more reasonable disaster scenario would be that it happens over many months. We're synced with your bank account. So we see it coming. It won't be a giant surprise like, oh, hey, like they ran out of money. We know, right? I mean, we can mm-hmm. monitor cash flows. We also have a banking product. We're a fintech company. We're not a bank, right? Of course, we have um, an underlying bank partner uh, that handles all of those bank deposits. But we also I have would love to. I'd love to secure. dive into that detail for the audience. Sure. What is the difference between a bank, like a traditional bank and a fintech company? Yeah. So, so we're essentially <laughs> the tech layer on top of it, right? I mean, it's a great question. Yeah. And so yeah. we are not the bank. Um, banks hold bank charters. And, you know, of course, there's, there's quite a bit of compliance involved in that. Um, so we, we partner with a bank, right, that handles all of that compliance work. We, of course, have quite a bit of compliance that, you know, that we have to uh, yeah. focus on and adhere to, right? But the bank itself has the ability to provide FDIC insurance, to hold deposits, yeah. to do that sort of- uh, Almost like know. utility companies, right, in this yeah. equation. Yeah. They're kind of like the, you know, the electric company or the That's water right. company. That's right. Uh, and then you have technology that can sit on top of that, you know, new whiz bangery end phase microinverters or whatever. But <laughs> that, that's true. Yep. That's just why is mercury everywhere? I see them almost every startup using mercury. Yeah. What's interesting, mercury did a really good job uh, where they, you know, they took a target market. They said, hey, look, we're going to create unique solutions specifically for startups, right? I mean, of course, they have to expand beyond that now and, and have done so. They've done a nice job, I think, uh, grabbing BC uh, deposits and, you know, some other groups that, that they're going after. But um, they did an exceptional job early on solving 
really key pain points for some of these startups. It could be things like wires and making sure they're secure or, you know, other little, uh, you know, just a much better uh, UI uh, that, you know, you can use as a startup, right? Like some of these little details seem like not much, but they mattered quite a bit and they did a nice job um, really, mm. you know, syncing with, um, you know, the startup ecosystem to begin with. They partnered with um, incorporation type companies, right? So, when you're starting up a business, right, you need a bank account. So they did a nice job, I think, getting really off the ground that way and growing word of mouth. And, and now, obviously, they're uh, they're quite large. And, and look, they position themselves exceptionally well uh, for you know the bust of SVB, right, for example. And so you know when when you know mm. SVB had its challenges there, Mercury was perfectly positioned to take over uh, a massive. Yeah, they're like deposits. we're not overweight on treasuries that just. Yeah. Drop fifty percent in value. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. And, and Mercury is a fintech, right? They're not the bank. They have an underlying bank as well um, underneath it. Yeah, that's right. Oh, interesting. So Mercury is partnering with banks underneath their kind of fintech layer. Correct. Yeah, they're not a bank. That's right. And that's you'll really see all the disclaimers everywhere on their website. Yeah. Mercury is a fintech company. We're not a bank. I mean, these are all you know disclosures that that you yeah. need to make. But um, I think you'll start to notice that more and more as you pop um, pop around and see a bunch of fintechs. Most of them are not. Uh, banks is certainly almost none of them are banks. We kind of we kind of just came out of a fintech winter, you might call it. Um, you know, I remember ten years ago, back when I was just like doing AI B two B SaaS. I remember so many people were fintech this, fintech that, and then it kind of fell out of favor. Um, I feel like around the late twenty tens. Yeah. Um, and then it's kind of coming back now. What, what, do we, yeah. what do you think that cycle looks like? What, yeah, why is it the right time for you to start a fintech company? Sure. Yeah. It's always, it, there's this interesting sort of wave and, and resurgence, right? I mean, there's, you know, yeah. the, I think I've seen people break it down into phase one, phase two, phase three of fintech. There'll be a phase four, you know, whatever that, <laughs> that might look like, right? I mean, I think, um, I think a lot of people were hot on fintech in, you know, I don't know, call it, you know, 2020, 21, maybe somewhere in there, but, you know, people were bullish on a lot of, uh, right. startups, I think at that point, but, um, you know, valuations got pumped up. I think, um, you know, I think that was really the challenge. A ton of money was pouring into FinTech. And so, you know, these, a lot of these startups just didn't live up to, um, to the hype or to the valuation there. They got They're priced still... on multiples on their gross revenue too. I, I think a lot of totally. investors kind of flooded into the market and they were like, yeah, gross revenue multiple of hundred X. Yeah. And they realized like the net was like 15% of that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so they really just underwrote something at a thousand X. That's right. That's exactly <laughs> right. So, so obviously like that's not sustainable. That's not going to work. Yeah. The underlying business can be quite good, but is it, yeah. you know, does it deserve that type of multiple? No, probably not. No, certainly not. Yeah. Right. And so, so I think yeah. you had that challenge though, you know, uh, you're starting to see it warm back up again, right? You're starting to see it fall back in a favor. And, and a lot of that is that I think, you know, investors and, and, you know, startup operators are realizing Fintech is everywhere, right? It's embedded in almost everything that you do. When you start to look at um, a lot of these businesses, right? Like underlying them, like a ton of that money comes from Fintech, even something like an airline, right? You wouldn't even think of as almost like a bank, but you start to see the rewards programs and some of these other, it makes up a ton of their revenue, right? They're essentially acting as a bank in a lot of these ways. And so Fintech is everywhere, many, many angles on it. Um, like any industry, you can't do a one size fits all, but it's starting to warm back up for sure. Yeah. Tell us about, um, I remember you have a partnership with Visa. What's that about? We do. Yeah. So, uh, so look, we do, you know, obviously we do the working capital side. We have, you know, the banking functionality again through our partner bank. And then um, ultimately for us, we, uh, you know, we, we struck a, a pretty nice deal with Visa to launch a charge card. Right. And so as you think about the cycle of working with real estate owners, right. I mean, they first come to you really probably to borrow money from that working capital side. They then save with you through that deposit account. And those two are, are pretty tightly linked, right? And then, of course, they need to use the money in some form or fashion. And so certainly you could, you know, you could wire out funds, you could, you know, withdraw them however you like. But one thing that they uh, really wanted was like, hey, can we have a, a charge card or a credit card type solution? And so, um, so we worked with Visa to, to, you know, work through that and say, hey, what could we offer on this side? Um, Visa gave us a... A very good deal, right? And uh, nice. I said, "Hey, look, let's launch with you, right? Um, we'll launch a charge card product. It makes sense, right? I mean, these are very high value customers. They're they're multifamily owners. They uh, they have a lot of cash coming in, a lot of cash going out. So, going back to kind of the early days of your career, how did that inform uh, what you're doing today and being an entrepreneur? 
Yeah. So it's, it's really come sort of full circle. Uh, you know, we, you know, in my, in my early career, I was at, um, at just a very early stage startup called employee number one. Right. I mean, and really it was, while I was in college, the tail end of my college, uh, career, um, I actually joined, um, joined up with a startup that was the precursor to angel list. Right. I mean, it's, um, uh, in the early days we were trying to connect startups with business partners and funding sources and, and all of this stuff. Um, we actually grew into a, a sizable business. I mean, it was a multi-million dollar uh, business wow. there, but I was, you know, quite young in my journey. Joined up with an experienced founder who had, you know, built uh, and sold a company previously, and so, you know, really for me, that's where I learned. Um, just you know, learned to just go for it. Right? It was, uh, I think, super formative. Where you just you quickly understood that nobody had the answer. Like, just go figure it out, right? It's like, you know, there's no like real playbook. This is a startup. It's, it's like, we don't like, know. Hey, go I, talk like, to somebody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, literally like, uh, like, yeah. hey, like go run paid search. Like, what does that mean? Right? Like, go figure it out, right? And so you're like, and these are the early days. <laughs> you know, this is, you know, call it early 2000s. And so, yeah. you know, you could do a lot of things like that. There's a lot of arbitrage. A lot of things weren't figured out. You couldn't just like Google, like best practices on paid search. Like it wasn't really a thing, right? And so, um, so you just sort of figured it out, right? This is like, you know, the earliest, earliest days. Um, from there, I moved to another company that was already an established company. They'd raised some funding. Uh, you know, they had, you know, product market fit. They were, you know, they had a lot of traffic. It was a big SEO play. Um, and so I joined there and that's really where I, I had my first sort of formative years running product, right? And just really learning, like, how do you approach this? Uh, you know, how do you, you know, how do you join a formal team? How do you lead a product team? How do you think about roadmaps and strategy and all of this stuff over time? And so, you know, that, that really was the stepping stone into growth then for me, right? I mean, we were in a company that was, it had product market fit, we were scaling. And so it's like, now, how do you grow? Well, growth is only, I don't know, maybe 10 years old, maybe a little bit older as a, as a discipline now, right? Yeah, and so I'm, this I, was like, I was in it 10 years ago. Yeah. About yeah. 12 years ago, I was doing demand gen about 2012 was my first growth yeah. job. Th that's exactly uh, right. Yeah, exactly. And it wasn't called growth hacking yet. It was just called demand gen. Like you are Literally. the demand gen person. Go generate yep. leads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, you had some of the OGs, the Sean Alice's of the world, who, you know, calling yeah. the growth hacking term and, you know, all these things, which yeah. is, you know, way back in the day, but but it's the same thing, right? You, you know, we had already started to form some of these principles, these frameworks, and now it's like, okay, look, like it's turning into a thing, right? And fa uh, Facebook famously had, you know, a growth team and, and all of this stuff. Um, that, that's when I moved to San Francisco. So all of this was, you know, back in Columbus, mm. Ohio, where I'm from. And, you know, it's a, a small startup pond, though, you know, it's, it's actually grown. Oh, you're, you're a since first employee at, at, at a two person, three person startup in Columbus, Ohio. I didn't yeah. know that. Oh, yeah. That's wild. Yeah, so yeah, what, way back what made you take? The, what was your undergrad, and what made you kind of take that job out of college? Yeah, I was in finance and logistics in my undergrad, right? So Same. you know, totally I was finance as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, um, chance, chance meeting, really, right? I was working yeah. on a project, um, and this, uh, you know, the the main founder from this this startup was actually an advisor to that project, and he just asked, you know, I, I was meeting with him to get advice on, you know, the thing that we were working on. He said, you know what, man, like what are you up to after this? Right. And I'm, I don't know. I didn't have any plans, right. You know, you're in college, you're still going to wow. class. I was like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't have the grand plan yet. He goes, you know, I got this idea cooking up. Look, let's go do it. Right. And so, um, so join there. So wow. really chance happening, but I knew he had, you know, had been successful in the past. I always enjoyed, you know, the idea of entrepreneurship, starting things, all of that. Um, and so, you know, I, I took the plunge and never looked back. So, um, you know, fast forward, Led growth at a number of venture backed startups in San Francisco. Um, you know, met in the early, early days, Andrew Chen and, you know, then right. you know, uh, later, you know, obviously a uh, huge fan of Brian Balfour and the work they're doing over at Reforge. Um, yeah. I was actually really, really fortunate. I, I ended up, uh, you know, joining the very first cohort of what's now Reforge, but Andrew was, uh, putting it on and, you know, got a group of growth folks together. And, uh, that really sort of codified the frameworks that. Yeah, uh, that we started to use, you know, pirate more and metrics more. And, and things like all that. Of that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all that David stuff. Kluwer and all those guys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so these are the early days. And again, we, you know, we were using a lot of this stuff, but just really thinking about it more in these frameworks and, um, and really getting more structured around it uh, was a game changer and, and really led to, you know, um, some great, great career moves after that. So did growth for so you, a while. You said you were in product before you got into growth? I was. Yeah, I That's, was. So I did the opposite. I was in growth and then I got into product because 
I'm sitting here hacking. I think I was on my second, maybe third startup, just hacking away at the pipeline, hacking away at, you know, Optimizely and, you know, lifecycle management and sure. Google ads and, you know, just every, every little experiment I could do it, I just could not change for the revenue, no matter what I did. It was just like, there was a certain revenue per dollar spent. And that was it. A certain yep. amount of signups, a certain CAC. And I just couldn't grow the product anymore. No, no amount of referral loops or any, any, any tricks. I, I, I deployed all the tricks at the time. And, yeah, sure. and I remember thinking like, you know what? I got to change the onboarding flow in the product. And that's how I actually became a PM is uh, as I started working with the engineers and designers and, and the PMs, uh, much to their chagrin, because here's this like marketing demand gen guy. Yeah, coming great. Over. Here he goes. Yeah. Here he goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, you don't know product. Yeah. And I remember uh, the aloofness of the product team was a, a big turnoff for me. I was sure. like, why are you guys like think you're so, you know, so rad at everything? Yeah. Uh, you, <laughs> you, yeah. Like, I literally know how to change the revenue of the, of the company and you won't let me do it. And so I had to go all, all the way to the CEO. Luckily, I had like a direct line there. She, I reported directly to her as kind of the head of demand gen. I was a marketing company and she's like, yeah, you're, you're empowered. Go do it. And that's how I became a PM. I just changed the onboarding flow, which changed the revenue and yeah. the conversion rates and all that stuff. So it's kind of funny. You came from product to growth. Well, went yeah, the other actually, way. yeah, actually not, not dissimilar. So in that yeah. very first startup that I mentioned, you know, again, it was kind of like, just go figure it out, go do it. And so that's yeah. really where I first started doing, you know, paid search, SEO, those like, you know, that, that sort of side. So demand gen really in the early days. Um, yeah. And then moved into that next company, right? And that's where I really took on more product. Um, and so, you know, maybe not dissimilar, already had some of the marketing or demand gen background, took over product. I, I literally, in the first week that I was there, launched a subscription business for them. Uh, didn't ask permission, should have in hindsight. Uh, mm. It's probably not the right approach, uh, but, you know, got forgiveness later <laughs> because it turned into a multi million dollar business. And so, uh, you know, I think you, you start to do these things. It was a little more of the, like the cowboy era because I was at a three person startup before it didn't occur to me like, oh, you should go, you know, go get mm. approval, go work with people and, and all of that. Um, and so, you know, early, early days took on some product work and then later got into more formal growth, right. As we, we yeah. know it today, it's always evolving, but, you know, uh, so yeah, evolution. Yeah. Sure. I, I, so I think in summary, I mean, if you're coming out of college uh, or any kind of, you know, business program either start a company or go work for one uh yeah. as early as possible because that's where you're going to learn the most um yeah you know when you're you know you're the second or third person you're you're the second or third option at that company to get stuff done um you're going to learn a lot um and i had a similar experience in real estate you know when i when i washed out of wall street i ended up in real estate in hawaii of all places um and i was like employee number one at a real estate company and I learned everything about real estate, you yeah. know, just, just soup to nuts. We did everything, uh, you know, leasing, developing, you know, fee developing, property management, um, just everything you could possibly do in real estate. So I learned everything about it, which is why, I, you know, when I saw your company, I was interested and because I knew the space a little bit, um, not, not exactly the multifamily space, but sure. Yeah. So I yeah. think that's generally great career advice, you know? I think that's spot on, right? I mean, look, I, you know, I was sort of, uh, you know, met with a, a key decision, right? I mean, you nailed it. You're in college, you're starting to end and uh, there's the traditional path, right? You could have gone and, you know, taken a finance job somewhere, go do investment banking, you know, something like that, right? Yeah. Um, I'd seen that, I'd shadowed some of these folks, you know, you see the 120 hour work weeks and Ugh. all these things, which is fine. Like, you know, hard work is, is great, but it, like you start to look at it and say, it just doesn't look interesting, right? It's, it's just not what I wanted to do, but I saw this other path and, you know, certainly was fortunate to have met this other entrepreneur who had had success. And I said, look, like, that's exciting. Like, that's interesting. I want to dive in. I want to like move the mm. meter. I want you know, I want to have a direct impact. And, uh, and that was huge. The, the rest is history from there. So let's talk a little bit about your angel investing. Um, so yeah. I have it here in my notes. You've, you've angel invested. What do you look for in startups? Like how many investments have you made on that stuff? Yeah, yeah. So I, I funded, I don't know, probably upwards of 30 plus um, wow. companies at this point, um, all, you know, relatively small checks. So so pretty modest um, on that side of it. Um, have, have done it over the last, I don't know, five, six years, something like that. Um, look, like, you know, there's, there's all the things that you look for in companies. Of course, you like, you know, you care about the team, you care about the problem, the solution, those types of details. Um, can I add value, right? Um, mm. I, I personally, I look for pre-seed deals. 
yeah. uh, maybe seed. I definitely don't go beyond that. Um, I find that, you know, at, at the point that some big name VC has joined, my little check is not going to be meaningful, right? It's not, it's not going to amount to much and it's not worth yeah. you know, probably the, the risk reward at that turn. Um, that's what I like to say. I like to, like, I find people between friends and family rounds and big institutional rounds. That's kind of yeah. like where I sit too yeah. uh, as an investor, because once they get that big Sequoia check, it's like, I don't need your little, your little check anymore. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> you'll, get, you'll, you'll get stomped on, you, you know, by, by the yeah, time you're deleted. Yeah, you the round right? anyway. Yeah. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, look, like, uh, for me, if I, if I had advice for a first time angel investor or somebody like really just getting mm. into the game, for me, it's, um, look like you have to understand a few things. No matter what, you're probably not that good at picking deals. Like you think you are, and you've had a lot of like life experience. And you probably, you probably don't have a lot of deal flow. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, it's exactly yeah. what I was going to say. And, and you don't have a lot of shots on goal. You just, you haven't looked at enough deals. And that's just mm. the reality. We all, we all start there. And so one thing that really changed the way that I invest was, um, was early on joining, um, obviously you can join some syndications, right? That's super right. helpful to see deal flow coming through, um, you know, pros and cons to that. We all know, right. But, but certainly it's good to see the deal flow coming through. Right. Yeah. I think, yeah. um, another thing that's been formative for me, I joined a group, uh, called angel squad. It's run by, um, an early stage right. VC hustle fund. That is a community really of angels. And so, you know, sort of shameless plug for that group. I don't get anything for it, but, uh, love them. <laughs> but, but really it's like, it's very helpful to bounce ideas off of each other, to understand how other people are viewing deals, to learn what they're looking for, to understand details around term sheets and like, how does a safe work? And, you know, just basic details as you're getting yeah. into, um, you're investing. And so, you know, I would really encourage you to go partner there and, and realize like you need an edge. When you look at some of these prolific angel investors who have found, you know, Hey, I was one of the first checks into Uber. That wasn't by luck, right? I mean, you have an edge, you have access, you have, you know, you have the ability to find these deals early on. And so understanding, you know, what your potential edge is in the future, I think is, is key there. And, um, I'll leave you with a couple of parting thoughts on that one where um, I would say just, you know, for me personally, I would sit back, I would watch deal flow come through. I would try to analyze it. I would try to start to think about how you want to think about mm. deals, what's important to you. Uh, you know, how would you measure them? You know, however you want to invest, let deals go through, watch pitches come through, just get enough of them in, you know, get dozens yeah. and dozens through and you'll start to really hone in on like, Oh, that's actually a high caliber team. I thought I knew, but now I know mm. after I've seen 50, 100, 200, yeah. 500 pitches, right, come through. And you'll see that deal flow through syndications, through some of these groups. And, and so I think you'll start to get much better at, about assessing what a, like a, a good deal looks like, right? And, and then also know you don't have to write massive checks. In the early days, write a mm. handful of those $1,000 yeah. checks, $2,500 checks, whatever it is. I, I, I basically lose tell it. new investors, I'm like, okay, this is really risky. Uh, half of this stuff, maybe even 70% goes to zero. Probably, yeah. You should plan on um, at least 50 investments over a three-year time period, yep. uh, if not 100 over like a three to five-year time period. Think about how much can you invest across that many deals in that time period. Yep. Um, and maybe that's only a thousand bucks and that's fine. It's a thousand, it's a hundred thousand across a, you know, a hundred deals over three or three to five years. That's great. Yeah. Um, or join a fund, you know, shameless plug there. Um, <laughs> sure. but, but, but that's right. I mean, that's like, that's the right advice, right? Because you'll realize over time. I mean, I look back at some of my first investments oh, yeah. and I, I have to tell you, I, I can, I can never remember being more excited than some of my very first ones. Naturally, they're the worst, right? Like, of course, you're yeah, looking at me like, totally. why did I mess it? Like, you know, as and you look paradoxically, back. paradoxically, that's when you're writing the biggest checks. Of course. You, st you first start getting into it, you're writing 25K checks, yeah, in, in, which is a really bad idea, unless you can write 25, uh, 50 or 125K sure. checks, uh, then okay. But yeah, you're going to learn a lot. I remember it was a, it was a grad school friend of mine. Um, I kind of got turned off of, uh, on venture capital in grad school because I, I did the venture capital investment competition. And yeah. These guys are a bunch of blowhards. I was like, I don't want to be like these guys. Sure. And um, so I was like, I'm not going to do that. And I went off and did my AI stuff in the cloud. But I, um, a buddy of mine's like, hey, I, if you think you might want to do it someday, you might want to get started because you're going to make a lot of mistakes. Um, I guess this, the phrase is it Sex takes 10 million. Advice. Yeah. It, it takes 10 million to make a VC. And oh, I look yeah. at the, st you know, the stuff I did six years ago, uh, seven years ago when I was first starting to write angel checks. I'm like, oh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even have even looked at that. I wouldn't even met with that company. Yeah. <laughs> and yep. I wrote a 10K check into that company.
Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think, you know, the deal flow piece is just keep, just see a bunch of shots. Don't do anything. Yeah. Get tiptoe into it. Really like, you know, hone your, your decision making there and um, you'll do better in the long run and expect to lose like- it all. No doubt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is risk capital and, you know, Completely. you should not allocate more than five or 10% of your portfolio to it. This is not financial advice. Talk to your, you know, financial planner or whatever. Of course. Yep. Um, I have to put that plug. So what's the, what's the vision, uh, for the company, uh, you know, for release in, you know, 10, 15 years from now? Yeah, look, I mean, we have, uh, you know, quite a big opportunity, I think, ahead of us, right? I mean, real estate, obviously, is, as you called out, is just such a massive asset class um, in the U.S. And, and really in the world, right? And so we started with finance and, and banking services, and, you know, we can grow just such a huge business, I think, off of those alone. Um, but what's really interesting about release is that, you know, in the way that we fund, in the, the way that we offer these banking services, we have tie-ins now with all of your financial accounts, right? So we sync with mm. your other bank accounts, your credit cards, we can sync with your property management software, accounting software, all of these details. We see all the transactions, right? So now it's sort of this, um, mm. you know, this epicenter, right? Almost a general ledger where we see all of the transactions come through. And so now think about all of the financial products that could come off of that or the services that could come off of it. Could you spin up a, a SaaS business on, bookkeeping and accounting? Could you do AI enabled bookkeeping and accounting? Like there's n number of ways that you could monetize yeah. and really grow this over time and, and really help these investors grow their portfolio, right? Like, okay, like, of course we care about making money and we want to grow this huge business. But the reality is, is, you know, you're, you're helping the smaller investor, the mom and pop, who's frankly now going against the, you know, the massive institutional players in this space, you've got to professionalize, right? And so they don't currently have the tools to do so but they can, right? We can build that. Modern fintech infrastructure allows that. Uh, and we have the know-how in, in both, uh, both industries to get it done. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, let's switch to a rapid fire. Let's do it. Um, favorite city you've flown to as a pilot? You're a pilot? Yes. Uh, yeah, private pilot for fun. Um, wow. Look, it's, a, it's an interesting hobby for me. Um, gosh, allows you to explore, allows you to, you know, sort of get out there. It's, um, it's a challenging hobby, which I love, you know, you can always, uh, you can always learn, get better. And it's like, it's, you know, always evolving and, and you're never like really a pro, right. You just have to, to get better and better and practice. Um, gosh, I've done some, some fun stuff, sort of bucket list things. Um, you know, uh, flew around the islands in Hawaii. That was super mm. interesting. Um, Big mountain flyer. I love, love to fly in the mountains. Um, it's just a totally different type of flying. Um, I got my seaplane rating in Lake Tahoe. So being able to just dip in and land the plane wow. in Tahoe, game changer. Like That's so, so cool. much. Yeah, so fun. Um, yeah. Did a flight around, uh, did sort of a tour one day from Tahoe down to uh, Big Bear over to Catalina Island. You can actually fly out uh, over wow. the coast of LA and then come back up and back to Tahoe. So, Fun stuff and, and uh, you know, that's a whole loop that you can take. It's like, yeah, take off from Catalina, go up the Sierras to Tahoe and all the way back. How long does that take? Yeah, you can go. It was a long day, right? But you stop for lunch and do all that stuff, but probably six or seven hours of, you know, flying and, you know, stopping and and all of that stuff. So that was fun. And, you know, sort of coincidentally have another bucket list. Um, We'll be headed to Alaska here next week, actually, to go um, do some flying on skis, landing on glaciers and all that. So. Um, oh, wow. Insanely fun hobby. Um, highly recommend if you're interested. That's so cool. Yep. Uh, what's one startup trend you believe is overhyped? Oh boy. Uh, at the moment, of course, it's AI, right? I mean, this is like it's yeah. it's threaded through everything. Um, I think there will be some some big players that come out of it. I think right. AI is insanely useful. It's useful in you know your your everyday operations. I think I've seen a ton of deal flow come across where it's really. Chat GPT reskinned as something, right? So I think it's, there's going to be the great shakeout, right? It's one of those things where you know companies are overvalued right now and and all of that. Um, but AI will be amazing. Long-term. Yeah, I see a lot of 200x deals. Um, Insane in AI yeah. right now. It's just like I'm not touching that. Totally. Um, 200x your forward ARR? Uh, no, no thanks. You're yeah. probably going to exit for less than your uh, lick, lick pref. Like, and not only that, but it's evolving <laughs> so quickly too. Even the underlying tech is evolving. So it's just like, yeah. you know, trying to see what that's going to look like over time and, and really p- placing the right bets. Um, that's one for me. You know, you know what's interesting it. about this revolution versus past ones, I think? If you, if you look back at like, say, 
the database or the revolution of the 80s with Oracle and stuff like that or the yeah. internet revolution. Um, we have such a more robust startup and open source ecosystem than we yeah. had, you know, 20, 30 years ago that the winners will look completely different, I think. Um, a lot of, I think a lot of the value will actually accrue deeper in the stack and uh, up in the stack. And so like, you don't want to be stuck in the middle. So you're either hyperscaling stuff down at like, yeah. you know, the hardware layer in the cloud, you know, and a lot of those benefits will accrue to OpenAI, but also Microsoft, especially. And then all the way up in the application layer, applying the things to problems, or yeah. applying the AI to problems. You'll get a lot of unicorns there. And it's going to be really difficult to be like, oh, we're 10x faster at training than you know, our competitors. And that, that, and I've seen this a lot because I led the AI category at AWS. Um, that head start that you have gets whittled away so quickly. And it's hard to, hard to keep on that treadmill of like, oh, we're 10x faster, we're 10x cheaper. Not a very good place. To, you're kind of stuck yep. in the middle. And there, along comes, you know, the next Llama 2 model. Of course. Open source that is just as good as your thing that you have closed source. And, That's right. Sorry. Yeah, I think, yeah. yeah, if you're trying to build the model, the killer model, you're, you're probably going to lose in this space. I completely agree. I mean, look, I... You know, a lot of good takes have been had already on this category. Uh, you know, of course, the incumbents who have big data sets. I mean, those folks probably, uh, you know, leverage AI and, and get more benefit out of the gates versus maybe a small startup. Look, I don't have the crystal ball. It's a hot space. I think there's going to be some huge, awesome companies out of it. It's just one for me that it's tough to bet on because the multiples are already insane. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, what book has influenced you the most? Oh, what book? I I've read a ton of books. Um, I, I love to read. And, and really, I kind of go across all sorts of categories, right? So um, I read flying books, no shocker, right? Or I'll read real estate books or, uh, you know, business books, of course. Uh, I think Peter Thiel's book um, mm. has been, what is it? Zero to one or whatever it is. Zero to one. That's, yep. been, that's been a pretty good book. Let's see, you know, in the real estate space, there are tons of great books on how syndications work, uh, apartment buying, like really diving deep in some of these categories has been like uh, just really influential for me. I think those are great ones. You get the classics, the rich dad, poor dad, and somebody saying like, how do you think about, you know, business and life and, and all of that? Those are- Rich those dad, are poor dad really was an influential book for me 20 years ago, you know, yeah. coming out of college with a finance degree. I was yeah. like, oh yeah, going to work for somebody is probably a bad idea. Yeah. Um, I should start a business and I yeah. should be investing as much money as I can. And I remember another book in that, in that same category was millionaire next door. Yeah. Um, you know, and just opening my eyes to like, Oh, maybe people that are driving those fancy new cars actually are just spending all their money, you know, and, and, and they're really in debt. <laughs> Buying liabilities, right? Exactly. Buying liabilities. Yeah. Yeah. Buy assets, not liabilities. I remember that was a big lesson from that, yeah. from that book as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, I mean, there's right. tons of old classics and all of that. I think if there's any lesson there, it's like, continue to read, continue to dive into things. Podcasts are awesome. Books on tape are awesome. Right. Um, you know, anything you just get on Spotify, Audible, whatever. That's been insanely Podcasts helpful. Podcasts are the for worst. Me. It's the worst thing to listen to. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Uh, no, it's funny. I, I used to hate podcasts like yeah. 10 years ago. I was an audiobook guy through and through, and I read, yeah. I don't know, probably a thousand, two thousand books. I don't even know how much, sure. how many. Um, and then I kind of got to the point where I was like, this is all rep repetitive information. I've read so much that like there's yeah. nothing new here to read. And a lot of, and I think technology is moving so fast now that by the time you read a book, it's probably way out of date on Gone. what's actually yeah. happening on the ground. And so you want to listen to podcasts you know, actual entrepreneurs, VCs actually doing stuff in market. So you can actually understand what's happening right now. Yeah. Um, because if you're reading a book about venture capital, it's probably way probably out of date, way out of date. Yeah. I, I, or I AI think, or anything. Yeah. Any topic like that, for sure. If it's a, if it's a newer top, don't do a book, get the podcast. Yeah. It's constantly evolving, read blogs, whatever it may be. But if you're looking for like old school principles, you yeah. know, books, audio books, all of that, those are great. Yeah, totally. Uh, what's your go-to productivity hack? Oh, blocking off my calendar, hands mm. down, right? So I I constantly block off big chunks of time on my calendar. I think if you don't, I mean, we all know this, it gets filled with meetings and whatever else, calls, what have you. I think blocking off my time there to really just sit and think. How many hours per day do you think you do that? Oh, gosh. On I think average. If you, yeah, if you were to like say- Like or, or a 40-hour week, how many hours are blocked off? Yeah, let's say even in it, like, you know, call it an eight-hour day, and, you know, realistically, yeah. we work more than that. But just let's just call it an eight-hour yeah. day. I would say 
probably five or six of those hours are probably blocked off. Wow. Right? That's a lot. Yeah. Because you're really sitting and you're thinking about things. You're, you're trying to like, you know, see the big picture. What are the next two, three, four steps? What are key things that move the business? Let me work on those things right now, by the way, yeah. versus get interrupted for the next, whatever it may be, sprint planning meeting, or those things are all important. But yeah. the reality is, is very quickly, it'll be, oh, quick team sync or customer yeah. call or whatever. Those are important. But they don't move the meter three long hours. Term. Three hours is my my block. I do a half hour right after this, uh, just to walk and clear my head, and then yeah. an hour and a half at lunch, uh, where I usually, you know, I work out for twenty minutes. I have the tonal upstairs, yep. um, and you know, just another hour of like thinking time, and then an hour at the end of the day. So like after four o'clock. So sure. Yeah, and if you uh, factor you have, in, you have me you know, beat at five or six hours a day. <laughs> I do, but it, it counts exercise and all of that as well, right? So all of those things yeah. are critical, and you know, keeping your energy up and and all of that stuff. Uh, but yeah, just really, it's like it's thinking and doing time for yeah. me, right? Like moving the meter. Hey, like we have to go get a partnership. Okay, what does that look like, right? And now now it's the outreach and that sort of stuff, right? Like that's like doing time, right? Otherwise, it's it's too easy to keep punning and checking emails. And do, you know, it's all the things you know. Block your time, yeah. get focused, and really move the meter. Yeah, if I don't block off time, I'll I'll be back to back meetings all day, every day. Yep. You know, I've had I've had founders say like, "Hey, I don't see any time on your calendar for a couple of weeks." I'm like, "Yeah, see you in a couple of weeks." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and there's a reason for that. I, I, yeah. I think the other one I give you, and it's a, it's a you know a variant of that flavor is like a Sunday retro. So I actually will mm. block off time on a Sunday, and I have it's the funniest thing I have in my calendar. The list of questions as well. It just says Sunday retro list of questions in there. And mm. it, it, you know, you can put what you like in there, but it's essentially, uh, it, it literally forces you to look back on the previous week, right? What were you trying to achieve? Did you achieve the things you were trying to? What would you do differently, right? Mm. It's just, you know, sort of three basic questions in there. You could have more if you want to, but it really forces you to look back and say that ah, time waster last week. Shouldn't have done that, right? Let me change how I think about my time. What are the most important things coming up? Let's get those done. Right. That's huge. Yeah. And then you start the day that. on Monday and you already know what you need to do. Yeah. I love that. I did that for a while. And then I realized, um, I had no feedback for myself anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I did it for like five years. You, you uh, achieved it. Yeah. And I was like, I have nothing to learn. I have nothing to teach myself anymore. So I'm going to stop doing this yeah, anyway. There you go. You're at Nirvana. <laughs> you've, you've arrived. I, yeah. I'm floating above all <laughs> things. Right. Um, <laughs> Back to the syndic uh, syndicates. Um, sure. You you mentioned this. You know, there's pros and cons of joining a syndicate. Like, what do you think? Yeah. What do you think those are? Yeah, I think look like um, syndicates have have really sort of um, they've kind of run away, right? Like, you know, several years back, it was great. You could join a syndicate, and they were tight knit, and maybe 50 LPs or whatever the case. A lot of these syndicates now have three thousand, four thousand, five thousand yeah. different LPs. You don't really know the GP who's running the syndicate. They're sending tons of deals across. So you're, so many. you're yeah, you're looking at a lot of garbage, by the way. Um, a lot of these syndicates yeah. are overlapping. And so you see, you know, five syndicates syndicating the exact same deal. And so now I see it five different times. And so you, you get a lot of this stuff and it's hard to say, like, is it really a good deal? Or is it just that, you know, you're getting your own promote on this long term and you're, you know, you're you hoping know, that you know I find surprising because I, I was an angel of syndicate originally, right? Team Ignite. That was yeah. the premise, right? Let's Ignite started kind of like Hustle Fund, right? Yeah. Um, or Angel Squad. Sure. And, uh, you know, like everyone else, you know, we grew it to, you know, mul multiple thousands of people. And what I noticed, what I didn't like about some, some of the other syndicates is the sensationalism. That, that they have, like they're yeah. marketing the deal, right? Yeah. Instead of just being factually correct and just like saying, this is what we think. They're like, oh, we're, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like it's the best deal ever. And like, oh, we, we have 12 hours to commit. And like they're just yeah. doing sensational closing tactics. Yeah. Uh, and I think they're probably opening th themselves up to like litigation in the future. Down the road, uh, no doubt about it. it you you yeah. saw that like crazy and call it 2021, 2022 yeah. even, right? Like you would see a lot of this like, six hours left a16z joined exclamation exclamation <laughs> you know like all this stuff like this is the last shit you know and uh, so yeah, yeah you, you saw crazy marketing but they were all competing for dollars money was you know flowing like crazy then and yeah they were placing a lot of bets trying to syndicate a lot of deals 21 was a crazy year crazy to have time, a syndicate right? it was absolutely bonkers but but now you it's could... like ghost town right like you, you could have three thousand lps and it's tough to raise 100k from them right 
I, no I have trouble getting to 100K in syndicated deals. I'll, I'll yeah. say like these are strong pro rata opportunities with lots of revenue and growth. And I, I just, I, I don't even like running syndicates anymore because it's, yep. it just ends up being a waste of everyone's time, you know? Yep. Um, and I think what you're describing is exactly the case is it's just become oversaturated, you know, and everybody has the same stuff and everyone's overlapping and, um, and also there's just this chilling effect on the market right now. Yeah. Um, and we're probably still another year. We, we have this like venture capital hangover that we're getting over. Um, I agree. You know, the last time this happened, it took a couple of years, at least two or three years to kind of wash out every, every and reset expectations and get, get people back in the market and stuff like that. Yeah, I agree. And I think there's this double whammy effect too, right? Where a lot of these LPs got burned, right? I mean, like if you just think about the LP growth, right? Over, you know, 2020, 2021, a lot of these were newly minted wealthy folks who had, you know, made their money from an Uber IPO or whatever mm -hmm. it was, right? And so now these these syndications grew and, and everyone wanted to be an angel and jump in. And so they're pumping money into this and investing in deals. But then, you know, obviously VC money, you know, sort of soured and, and the market went down. But these same people that are LPs not only just got crushed in their investments at hyperinflated values, a lot of them lost their jobs too, right? And so now it's like, oh, I just got laid off and the hundreds of thousands of workers that got laid off. And also, all of my investments to date just got wiped completely, right? So it's like, ah, do I want to? Yeah, because like, I threw fund a bunch of money at 200x deals in yep. 2021 or whatever, 100x deals. And yeah. now it turns out like they have to grow for a few years to grow into that valuation. If exactly. they keep growing at the current rates, it might be yep. three to five years to grow into that valuation. Anyway. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So back to, yeah, if you could succinctly give one piece of advice for new angel investors, given all this discussion, what would it be? Oh yeah, gosh, I would say just, you know, take a look at deal flow, right? Just more and more deal flow, figure out how you get access to those deals and really hone your own investment decisions. Mm. Um, figure out your edge. How are you going to win over time? Uh, that's key. Yeah. And I think, I think generally focus, um, you know, I think what I, yeah. what I learned in my career was I'm not really good at consumer, <laughs> you know, like I'm just not good at judging it. And yeah. um, I'll, I've had a lot of failure there, so I just don't even look at it anymore. Uh, typically. That, um, it's a great point, so you, right? And, yeah, figure and, out what you think, what your superpower is. Like, yeah, you know, for me, like in you, it's like finance and B two B SaaS and and things like that. And sure. I can look at those and size them up pretty well because of my experience. But consumer, just it's a mystery to me. Exactly. <laughs> like I avoid deep tech. Like I'm not, you know, like space yeah, exploration. Yeah. And somebody say like it's just I don't know it well. It's like it's like such long shots. Highly likely it doesn't work. Um, you know, it's just everyone has their thing. But besides flying, what's your favorite leisure activity to unwind? Oh, gosh. Um, wow. I've really, uh, really been getting back into. So, you know, way back in the day, I was uh, big into jujitsu and mixed martial arts and all that. And fairly recently, I uh, found a gym locally here and uh, started getting back into it. Uh, it's a great way to exercise for me, right? I mean, I'm not cage fighting and doing all that stuff, right? But like, yeah. but it's, it's just been a, a fun way, good camaraderie. Uh, good to hang out, like get some time away. It's completely this is BJJ? different. It is. Yep. Yeah. It is. Those yeah. are those classes are intense, man. I've done like yeah. maybe five or six. Uh and you know, your whole body is sore the next day. Like you sure. use every single muscle in your body. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it and so like, you know, but it but it forces you to exercise at a level like that, you know, candidly you probably wouldn't otherwise if you're just out mm -hmm. on your own taking a leisurely jog or something like that. And so that's yeah. good. And, and look, I enjoy the sport. I did it for years, um, you know, way back in the day. And so it has been fun to, to jump back in. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Ryan, uh, thanks so much for coming on. It was a great conversation. We appreciate having you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, really enjoyed my time.